I don't usually do this for most guests because most guests uh, may not be worthy of this, but I'm going to play a theme song. This is something that probably runs around in the movie for this man's life. It sounds like this. Thanks thanks for joining us tonight, Neil. Sorry about the delay. Hey, no no problem, no problem. How are you? Good. There's always so many... It's all bracket, bracket, so, you know? That's right. Neil's, Neil's those that don't know, is a big U of M fan, and there's... Is there a game on or something like that? Just kidding. Yeah, uh, big big mission game on tonight. That's right. Trying to... I lost... Unfortunately, I'm not going to... Get a piece of Danny Gilbert's billion dollars. I couldn't call one of the games right, but so uh, I'll be practicing right. off a bit longer. So what are you gonna do? So, so look, lot, how are you? What's going on? I'm good. There's a lot of topics, and I, I want to get right to it because a lot of people are interested. Yeah. I did not uh, <clears throat> talked a little bit about you know the the trial that we had spent a lot of time talking about. I had one you know immediately before, and just some of the challenges of that, and some of the factors that uh, played out in that trial. Um, tell people what your, you know, what that experience was like for you, and uh, some of the highlights, lowlights, um, Monday morning quarterback lights, if any, and uh, what advice you could give to people if uh, they're going down that road. Okay, so uh, it, we had a case uh, involving 1.8 pounds of marijuana and money and baggies, but we had a terrific medical marijuana defense, and the defense was centered around. Um, the making of extracts. We had formulas and charts and diagrams that um, that actually showed that the amount of marijuana that our client had was really a reasonable quantity um, and that we estimated that given his production and how he made wax that the amount of marijuana would end up uh, lasting him you know, no more than uh, 60, 75 days given his use. And he was a very compelling witness, and uh, the jury um, was out uh, for uh, about three days. They ended up hanging, so it's a hung jury. And he was there were about six or seven jurors that were um, that were for acquittal. There were a couple that were for uh, guilty as charged, and there were a couple that were um, wanted to commit them of a misdemeanor possession of marijuana. I, that's the backdrop to the story. What was really int- what was fascinating was that after the jury left the, the the jury room, we got a chance to go in, and the judge let us take a look at all of the jurors' notes and post-it boards and things that they had drawn. And never was it more apparent to me than it was in that room, looking at all those charts, how critical it is to one for patients to see competent doctors. And physicians too, that they have to they have to take control of the the patient physician relationship. I put patient first because the patient has to really push the physician to to regularly interact with the physician so that it God forbid you end up being charged with a crime, you have your physician can come to court and say that they have regularly monitored, that they have uh, tweaked or altered or kept in in touch with how um, marijuana has benefited the patient. And let me tell you why that was so important. Because we saw, because the prosecutors, what they did in the case was they, they used a very old approach to cross-examining the doctor, who in our case was terrific. He was fantastic. Guy finished summa cum laude, which means that he graduated at the top of his class or close to it at Wayne State uh, undergrad. He went to Wayne State Law School. He finished near the top of his class there. He's on staff at Henry Ford. The guy is triple sharp. He's read study after study. He's got a terrific curriculum vitae. He sees patients. I mean, he is sharp. And all I can do is tell you that the prosecutors went after him and went after him on on essentially three grounds. One, they went after him on the fact that there he had no historical training or education in cannabis. So he hadn't had any in in um, uh, um, undergrad. He didn't have any other than a, a portion of one lecture in med school, didn't have any at the hospital, didn't have any during his rotation. 
uh, and didn't have any up until 2008 and still really hasn't had any training other than what he's read online and what he's been able to kind of discern and figure out since 2008 and 2009. And I saw how important that was because the jurors actually on a board, when they were talking about the bona fide physician-patient relationship, they actually wrote all of that material on a chart in the negative. In other words, they, they bought into that, or at least a couple jurors bought into that as a, as a detraction from the doctor claiming that his relationship was bona fide. Second, they went after the fact that the doctor did not regularly monitor the patient. Now, this doctor saw our, my patient every six months and had charts on it, but they, there was no objective data. So the doctor didn't have a, according to the, the prosecutor and a couple of the jurors, the doctor didn't have an MRI, he didn't have a, an EEG, he didn't have an EMG, he didn't have a CAT scan, he didn't have anything to document the injury that, that my client claimed. And they put that up there. And third, there was, despite the fact that he saw him every six months, which was more than I see my doctor every year, he um, allowed the patient to leave the facility with a recommendation in hand and did not tell him dosage. So that taught me a lot, even more than I thought I knew. Michael, you still there? Yes, I am. Keep going. Okay. So it taught me more than I even than I than I knew. And here's what I, here's what it taught me. That one, there's. I think I'm as good a lawyer as any in court. I can tell you that in court, there's only so much we can do when we've got 12 jurors sitting there. And what I mean by that is that we've got a couple days over the course of a couple of days with another voice in the courtroom, the prosecutor and their witnesses, to try to convince the 12 strangers that, that this is something that they should find to be reasonable. And that is a really important, because you understand that they're using their own life experiences to compare it to. And so when you have a doctor who doesn't even meet the minimum threshold, and my doctor did, so we were able to get at least half the jurors to accept the defense, if you don't even have that doctor in there, and you got someone that sees the patient once at, at a convention, a motel, a hotel, in the back of a truck, I don't care where they see him. If that, if it doesn't to the jurors sound like a legitimate relationship and a real relationship, you've got a problem. My doctor had a brick and mortar shop, a brick and mortar office. He had charts. He was credentialed at a hospital, and this jurors, there are several jurors who still had difficulty with um with him so if you're you know, gonna I, be, if you're gonna go go ahead man go i was ahead. just gonna jump in i just this is a you know we we go I, you know that's one of my themes on the rant of uh trying to should be a regular rant honestly and uh you know we were at that event last year and there's something somewhere coming up i think in, in grand rapids where you know you me john targowski david verdoy uh yep. spoke at one of those things and you know, we all agreed at the time that uh, if you got, if you paid for a certification here, throw it away, you know, because it's meaningless. And it, it, it really is. And I think it causes problems for everybody else. There's no question that this has been the kink in the armor of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. What the community as patients have come to learn and understand as the way is not the way it's being addressed in court. Now, the difference is that in every other type of treatment, if a doctor tells you to do something, go somewhere, go over there, bend over, whatever it is, you know, most people, listen, they agree, they follow that advice. And if a doctor doesn't tell you to come back to see me or report to me or let me know how things are going, then the patient doesn't think they have to do it. So I agree with you, and, and we're, we're saying the same thing, and I say this all the time. Patients, and especially the caregivers on behalf of the patients, have to be more responsible for their own personal medical chart. And the other point, which you were getting into, the criticism of the doctor, I'm going to throw it back to you after this, of, of, of even suggesting that they need to know these things, that these things actually exist in a way that a doctor would accept them scientifically. You know, we know that cannabis, I mean, I don't know, this is not going to open up another debate, but the point is that there's not a lot of, you know, driven into the traditional a method of care, cannabis treatments, and to expect doctors to know that. Furthermore, I mean, how does one doctor know how concentrated this bag of marijuana is or whatever versus another one? You know, 
one person may need same person may need to smoke the entire bag. The other one may need one puff on it because of the different components that are made up of it. But I guess there's a lot of con- con- you know mixed questions. But what do you? I mean, wh- how do we deal with it? What do you think about all that? Okay, so let me tell you. I think about it. I I think that one of the one of the issues that we have to deal with in in addressing this is we have to distinguish between what we lo- what we want, what we think it should be, and what it currently is. When you and I are arguing motions or we're arguing issues uh, like you're arguing in your one case that you currently have before uh, you know Judge Grant, we can argue what it should be and what and what what we think it ought to be, and we have the luxury of being able to to try to advance to to reform even if we're in court to reform things to make it better. Um, and to get the, the law in line with what we think and what we believe the doctor's responsibility should be and what the limitations of the doctor's involvement should be. The problem is is that once we're in court and we're arguing these cases to judges and juries, we are constantly, in my opinion, this is my opinion, we are, we are butting heads with a cynical public who believes that the Medical Marijuana Act is nothing more than normalization or legalization or decriminalization in um, sheep's clothing. And that's what they're on guard for. That, I believe, is what... Because the law doesn't require a doctor to do any more than certify. We know that. And the couple of cases that say that doctors have to do more than that or that caregivers have to do more than that, are just inconsistent with the statute. But that's what we're currently having to deal with. The statute doesn't say that a caregiver has to do anything more than than provide or transfer or give, right? It doesn't say that. And the law certainly doesn't say that doctors have to do anything more than recommend because you and I both know that there's a, a line of cases that says that that's all a doctor can do. True. But people yeah. want to, people, But people want to view... There's a cynical portion of the public, and unfortunately, they are overrepresented in law enforcement, in the executive branch, in prosecutor's offices, and on the judiciary. They are overrepresented. And that group of people believes that they want to see marijuana treated the way and handled the way that traditional pharmaceutical medication is. They don't understand that it is an alternative medication and that there are limitations on what people can do, what they can authorize based upon the differences in plant and plant type and reaction in pharmacokinetics, uh, in tolerance. There are as many factors as there are cannabinoids, you know what I mean, that impact why a particular patient would use more or less or how often You'd, a, a, a doctor would have to literally be using them. I mean, they have to be the twin of the patient and using the marijuana along with the patient in order to be able to have an idea of how to advise the patient. You know what I well, mean? That's, that's just it. And, and you know, for those that so we're listen. dealing with there. We're, so so that, that that therein lies a challenge, and we can debate the policy of what it should be all day long. I agree with you. If if I were the person that was the the ombudsman or the overseer of the of the of if they created a new position and it was the position of mer- of medical marijuana czar, and so I got to decide all this stuff, I would just set out the rules and I would set out the rules and I would say a doctor only has to recommend. That's it. That's all we care about. That's all I care about. I don't care. I I, I don't care where the doctor did it. I do want the doctor to to have to have attempted to learn more about the patient's health, but I don't need the doctor to have, you know, to say that marijuana is going to help the patient because the statute doesn't require it. The statute just says the doctor has to, has to say that it is likely, which means that the doctor has an opinion that it could, right? right? So, that's right. But, but that's not where, but I, if I had my say, I would, that would be part of my, like, you know, my bill of rights that I would put forward for patients and doctors. I would not put, anybody in the position of having to do any more than come in and say that just what I said a second ago, but that's not where we're at. We have, and I'm going to tell you, I watch these jurors. I'm telling you, I watch them. 
there was a time, Michael, where we believed that all we had to do three, four years ago, we kept thinking, all we got to do, and we had clients who said this to us, all we got to do, Michael, all we got to do, Neil, is say the words medical marijuana in front of the jury, and they're going to magically, like a talisman, they're just going to you know, going to go blank, and they're going to quit on jury nullification. And I'm here to tell you, because I believe that I came closer than anybody has in Oakland County and getting an acquittal in a medical marijuana case, that is not the case. These jurors pay attention. They want to, in the end, do the right thing. They don't want to be hoodwinked. They do not. I watch these jurors. And if I give the case another rip, I'm going to watch them again. But these jurors do not want to, they do not want to, are you still there? Yes, I am. They don't was, want to say, they don't want to find somebody not guilty saying that it's for med- a medical purpose and be lied to. They want to believe it. Right. No, I understand. And, you know, our cases were a little bit, uh, a little bit different. And I uh, ended up not calling the uh, certifying doctor. I pulled some kind of, it was a very, I, we had a terrible sort of just the opposite of yours. I know. And, I know. Um, I remember, I know your case well, and you know my case well. Your but listeners you know, don't know that you and I talk weekly, so we we have weekly, if not well, more, strategy conversations. And, and I kind of leaked this when I was talking about the rant, and I thought that this had a huge impact on, you know, what would have normally been a, an automatic guilty on a, an account. You know, and then my kind of case, it's either, you know, you're either going to get not guilty on all or guilty on both. Right. And, they, and And the not guilty came from, you know, what I described as, is a point that we spent a lot of time on, which is that the debate over whether it's medical or drug trafficking from the people's position is one that is patently flawed, can be torn apart and effectively used to convey the message that they, re- you know, at least I did that. Cause, I mean, yours was a little bit I more I did it too. I, 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 but, 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 we, but, but listen, but I, I agree with that. But I believe that these jurors, look, this doctor was triple sharp, okay? And I, and it dawned on me that, you know, when we're trying these cases, that, I, and I'm telling you because you have, a, you have a large listenership who are medical marijuana patients and caregivers, and many of them go to doctors who, who we don't even know if they'll end up coming to court or they'll be cooperative uh, and if, even if they are, let alone if they're going to be any, you know what I mean, if they're going to be good. And I'm just telling you, at all the fairs and the expos and, the, and those where I've walked in and we've seen some somebody in the corner doing certifications, that's bullshit, man. You're buying yourself nothing. You are buying yourself the card you get does nothing other than, because you know what? It does nothing to really protect you. Because you know what? If some police officer stops you and you flash that card, he's got to decide whether he's going to arrest you. And if he arrests you and and you start flashing around your card, they're still going to arrest you. And if you get arrested and you get released, you know what? They're going to try to get – they're going to ask you to come to court. Under some recent cases, they're going to make you prove up your your doctor-patient relationship like they did in that ridiculous Hartwood case. And if you have to prove up your relationship and you say you met the guy at a, at a fair or at a convention, I'm sorry, man. You are going to be SOL. You know, it's, and I, so you know I, what? I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that that's the that's the state of the law that we're in. Because Lord knows, I fought my ass off for it. I know, Michael, you've devoted your your life to, you know, outside of your family to trying to 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 protect this law. And I certainly have spent the last four years fighting on every level I could. And I'm going to tell you, this is where we're at. So we can be realistic of where we're at, or we can keep our heads buried in the sand. Realism calls requires me to say that if you've got a card that was premised on a on a momentary meeting with some doctor over uh, Skype or in a motel or in the back of a van or at the, uh, um, you know, one of those, um, whatever, the Dixieland, you know, Gibraltar Trade Center, wherever it is, I'm telling you, you got nothing. You got nothing. We've joked in the That's past. Unless, we've joked in the past. What's that? You know, like, we've joked in the past when you get the call or you're meeting with a potential client in the office and you say to them, who's your doctor? And they say, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, you know, they're over at the, uh, the high times convention. Yeah. You know, I saw him yeah. there. And, you know, and, and, and we grimace, right? Michael, right. we grimace. We like, we literally get that cut. We say, we're like, Oh no, 
We know, know the we... battle that's ensuing. I we, we know it. We know what's going to follow. And you know what? It's just it doesn't need to be that way. And I'm. And you know, and it, I go back to the beginning where there was a handful of lawyers. We'll mention who they are. That they passed around such bullshit advice to people about how the gray areas were areas that they could operate in, and people did that and they got screwed. There's a whole another bunch. Then you got these doctors that set up shop, and they're just making money hand over fist. I'm telling you, they're like the guy in the sneeches who just takes money to change someone's star. You know what I mean? And you know what? The, they get nothing. But the only person that benefits out of that deal is the doctor or the center that he works for. And I'm, I'm telling you, if you're a legitimate patient, you got to call someone like Kamorn or me, or you got to call someone and ask for, hey, if you want a legitimate medical relationship with a doctor, there is a handful of guys out there that you can talk to, and they will they'll back you up. But the rest of it is nonsense. The only reason Michael, you and I keep go ahead. I was gonna say the only reason people, you know, it's silly. I mean, but people have to get a card to protect themselves. And if you're gonna go down that I road, I understand that. Except that, don't, except you know, it's not only to say this, but you know, I saw I saw a discussion recently with Jamie Lowell and someone on uh, Jamie was on the uh, on, on Facebook, and he talked about you know the discussion that was going to be coming up about, you know, the doctor patient relationship and the need to avoid expo, you know, type, you know, certifications and, and motel, you know, room certifications and that kind of shit. And somebody else got into an argument with them about, you know, how it shouldn't be that way. Well, okay. It shouldn't be that way. And yes, we can all find analogies in, in, in the real world where my kid has stubbed her toe or needed a, a scrape and met a doctor up north who, uh, you know what I mean, saw her, put a bandage on her, and gave her some medicine. And the law would recognize that doctor's relationship with my client, with my daughter, even though they, 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 they'll they never remember each other other than, you know what I mean, just like general fuzzy images, right? They knew each other for 10 minutes, if that. The law will always recognize that as a doctor-patient relationship, you know, but there's no cynicism surrounding that. And there is cynicism surrounding what we're talking about, and we have to be honest about it, deal with it so we can protect people. And it starts with the patient, and it starts with the caregiver. So we can keep saying what we want it to be, or we can tell people the way it currently is. And the way it is is you need to grab a hold of you. You need to treat this doctor relationship different than any other. I don't like it, but that's the, that's the reality. I, I know you agree with me, Michael. Even if we don't want do. it to be that way, that's the way it is. That's it. The, the, pre, the premise, the, pre, the preamble before we would say this is, this is not my or your interpretation. This is legal advice in the current situation. And... The real question is, and we're doing it in light of these two terrible cases that came down. And it's an observation. It's not even, it doesn't even require legal advice. Look, Jamie's not a lawyer. Chad's not a lawyer, though he, you know, he works in, in, in you know, connection with you. But they're both sharp people. They see this. I know Chad is listening or on, has a headset or has a microphone. Right, Chad? Are you there? I hear you. I hear I mean, you. Do you see anything different? No, that's the way that it is. It's, it's, it's terrible that it's supposed You're to be correct. this way. But, you know, so what I'm saying like, is, it doesn't, it's not legal advice. It just is. It's just, this is what it is. And until the law changed, until the interpretation of the law changed, we have a responsibility to, since we're there and we know it, to tell people that aren't there and are being misled that they need to, honestly, they need to grab this shit by the horns and, and, or the balls and they need to actually take control. Because the doctor, the doctors are, are the, listen. So my opinion, this is my opinion, Neil Rockin's opinion. The medical community as a whole has failed medical marijuana patients. It has refused to embrace marijuana as medicine, despite the trend in the the in the mass media, particularly Sanjay Gupta, CNN, and some other stories that are coming out that are clearly supportive of marijuana as medicine. The medical community in the United States has failed to grab onto that. 
as a whole. They're still cynical. 